we did a workshop this weekend on humility. Um, and every time I do the workshop on humility, it's always, it's always, how should I describe it? It, it's basically so much of the workshop is, is nothing the devotees have expected it to be. And that's because when you discuss humility very deeply, you begin to get a glimpse, or maybe you get an ocean, that, you, that we don't really understand what humility is because we don't have much of it. And we were, were studying a lot of what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said about humility, and he was teaching it from his own realization. And he was being the Acharya in teaching how we should see others, how we should deal with others. And he said a lot of things which were kind of out of the realm of our own consciousness, of our own realization, of our own attitude. And little, it, it threw us off a lot, just because we've never, we, nev we never think the way he said a devotee should think. So he, he said such things such as, if I think I'm a devotee, I'm not a devotee. If I'm not humble, I will never be able to appreciate the devotees. If I fall, find fault with the devotees, it means I'm not humble. Even if the fault is there, it still means I'm not humble. So one of the things that, that came up was that a lot of times devotees as we all have this you know, tendency to be critical because we see things that we don't like or we see things that are wrong. So we see things that bother us or people bother us. So we tend to be critical. But one of the things that, uh, insights that we gained this weekend was that rather than s stop trying to be critical, we can better be positive, overcome a bad habit with a good habit, and try to focus more on the appreciation side. And what we realized is that if there's not a sufficient degree of humility, appreciation won't manifest. And naturally, being judgmental, condescending, sarcastic, critical, even offensive, will be more of a normal state of consciousness. So. But then we discovered that, that you can't appreciate other devotees, you can't appreciate it at least consistently, unless we become humble. Because we were discussing how lack of humility causes us to pass judgment on other people. And when a devotee develops, begins to develop something genuine in the in humility department, then he starts to see others better than him. So what the conclusion, one of the biggest take-homes of the workshop is that real humility, when it manifests in the heart, then you see everyone better than you. And, and you know, from our perspective, we think, well, how, how, how can you see everyone better than you when everyone isn't better than you? Isn't that artificial or won't that make you perhaps um, you're unrealistic in your approach. And, and part of the answer is yes, because if you don't have that realization, you can't artificially have it. But the other half of the answer is that's what humility means. So you can't, on the other side, you can't deny it. Right? You can't deny it. So, at least we have to understand what it is so we know what we're striving for and we know the attitudes we need to develop. So, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, if you think you're a Vaishnava, you're not a Vaishnava. Well, that's pretty simple. Kush, you think you're a devotee? Yes, I'm a devotee. No, that proves you're not a devotee. So, so, a Vaishnava should never think, I'm a devotee. 
he should only think or she should only think, I'm trying to be a devotee. I'm trying. That's it. I'm not a devotee. I'm not qualified to be one. I'm not one. But others, they're devotees. Every, everybody else is a devotee. Of course, then you might say, well, isn't this the level of the Mahabhagavat, that the Mahabhagavat sees everyone as a devotee, but he doesn't see himself as a devotee. Yes, at the same time, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta is describing that that's what it means, or that's what Vaishnava humility means. So, we can't be artificial, and we know that we're not all on this level, but still, we understand that as we're advancing, or if we are advancing, then the tendency to appreciate others is going to increase. The tendency to think others are better than us is going to increase. The tendency to feel ourselves lower is going to increase. The sense of our distinct, of us being distinct or special in some way is going to decrease. One of the devotees in the workshop told the story that once Ramanuja Acharya was walking up Tirupati, and then he heard that the mountain is actually an incarnation of Lord Seisha, so then he didn't want to walk on the mountain, so he crawled on it, on his knees. And his guru came down and said, you shouldn't do that, because then everyone's going to follow your example. And anyway, this is going to create a problem. I forget the problem it was going to create, but his guru came down to tell him that he shouldn't do it for some reason. And then Ramanujacharya said, why did you come all the way down the mountain? Why couldn't you have sent somebody with a message? And then his guru said, well, I was looking for somebody to send the message, and I wanted to find somebody, a subordinate, someone lower than me, with the message, but I couldn't find anybody. So I came down myself. And then we heard another story that Krishna Chaitra, who was a brahmachari and also a spiritual master, was scheduled to go somewhere to do some preaching programs. And when he got to the airport, the, you know, the devotees picking him up were told he's a guru. So at that time in ISKCON, they thought, well, if you're a guru, you're a sannyasi. So when they came to pick him up, they didn't know it was him. And they came to pick him up and said, well, we're looking for the sannyasi guru. And then Krishna Shetra said, well, can I get a ride back with you? So they brought him back and said, somehow or other, nobody knew who he was. And so I think he took us an as an opportunity just to live in a temple and not be honored. So they assumed that the guru never came and that Krishna Shetra was just um, there in the temple to do service. So he just stayed there and he did service. He worked in the kitchen, he cleaned the pots, this and that. And it was only like the last day that, that someone <laughs> told them that that's actually him, the guru who you were supposed to pick up and do all the programs. Something like that. And you may ask, why didn't he tell them this or that? I don't, I don't know the details of the story, but isn't that interesting? That he just did menial service? I find that quite interesting. Anyway, so, the, the Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he was explaining that always, always, a devotee thinks himself a servant, and he never thinks himself a master. So even when the devotee gets in the position where externally he has control over others, he's their authority, he never puts himself above them, but he always thinks they are better than them, better than him, and he always thinks he's a servant of them. That's always his consciousness. And, and he explained why. He said because... In conditioned life, obviously, we, we think we're enjoyers, we're controllers, we, 
we forget that we're servants. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said that in advanced levels of Krishna consciousness, you're, it's not that you forget you could forget you're a servant. You're situated. That's where you're situated. It's not that you forget it. You're always there. And therefore, that's why you can never become overcome by maya, my, by pride, or overcome by power when you're in a powerful position because you're always fixed in the consciousness, I'm servant. So even though externally you're up here, internally you're always putting others above you. And I found it really insignificant, uh, really significant that he said that unless we become humble, we will not be able to appreciate devotees. You know, and sometimes we find it's difficult to appreciate devotees, or we find people that that have a difficult time appreciating devotees. At least we should see in ourselves that if we have difficulty appreciating devotees, then there's humility is lacking in us, and if we are ten tending to find faults with the devotees, then we should understand humility is lacking. It's, it's, it should be a sign that there's a problem. And I think most of the time, if we become critical, we don't think it's a problem. We think, well, there's validity to my criticism. Here's a, a real situation, and it's not good, and I'm just talking about it and I'm explaining what's wrong with it. And, and in one sense that seems innocent, but Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said that that you know in the same situation you could see something which is positive. So if we're not if we're, if we're focused on something wrong, even if objectively it is wrong, it's still a wrong consciousness. That's that's his point. You know, in in most cases we don't have obligations to rectify wrongs. In most cases, we're just pointing out wrongs because we don't like them. They bother us. They disturb us. So, he never, he never justified that. I'm saying it's okay to criticize it if it's, if it's actually wrong. That may be reserved for, for certain devotees in certain positions, but in general, he was saying, that may be, but why are you focused on that? And so he said, because there's a lack of humility, we focus on that. That's the real reason. And oftentimes we think there may be so many other reasons that we focus on the faults, but he's saying, no. The real reason is we're not humble. So if we confront that, and then we'll be, maybe begin to realize that well, I could have seen something other than the fault, but I didn't. And so I'm not appreciating this devotee as much as I should or as much as I could, and that indicates there's a lack of humility in my heart. So that's how we should see it. So it should always be self-reflective. We're reflecting back on ourself. Okay, what's wrong with... You know, okay, I see a problem in such and such a devotee, but then I can say, well, what's, what's wrong with me that I'm seeing a problem. Why am I not seeing something positive about the devotee? You see, that's the way you're supposed to see it. Hardly anybody sees it that way. Hardly any of us see that there's a problem with us when we're seeing a fault in another. And again, the point is, even if it is a fault, it's, it's not. I'm not saying you're imagining it's a fault. You might be. But I'm saying, even if the fault is real, and you're seeing it, you should think, we should think, why am I focused on the fault? Does this person only have faults? Obviously, no. But why am I focused on the fault? There's something wrong with me. Okay, you might say there's something wrong with him. That may be. But there's something wrong with me that I'm focusing on what's wrong with him. That's the point. Very important point to understand. That is, that is um, how how we can understand what it means to be humble, because a genuinely humble person will not focus on others' faults. So we have some comments here. Jai Venurati, all glories to you. I didn't get to see the pictures of the play because Avananda sent, sent me a link, but the, there's nothing in the link. I couldn't connect, it was no longer valid. 
Okay. So Gurnishta says, someday we can attend the humility workshop. Yes. Gurnishta is going to be in India. We'll have to do it there. We have to organize it there. Sure, this is always difficult for me because to be successful in the material world, we reflect, I've achieved this, I've achieved that, whether in sports, job, etc. I'm making progress, I'm now here because I've done this. I'm having the realization that doing more service doesn't make me more advanced. In bhakti, but it seems always thinking, I'm not a devotee, I'm not a Vaishnava, seems to be a path to frustration and depression. That's That's... If you're thinking of it materially. See, if someone's thinking I'm not a Vaishnav, if they're actually thinking it, it's because they're feeling it. And if they're actually feeling it, they're very Krishna conscious. And if they're very Krishna conscious, it's not depressing or discouraging or frustrating. right? It's only depressing, discouraging, and frustrating to, to us who have big egos who want honor. Right? You understand? This is like, you know, okay, so so I understand your point, and uh, let's balance it a little bit. Okay, so you've done something successful. We don't want to deny that you've been successful. We don't want to minimize that at all. We want to acknowledge, okay, you've been successful. But we want, but for you, you should acknowledge that my success is only because of Krishna's mercy. And that's how I've been successful. I want to read what you said again to get more clear. Mm-hmm. That doing more service doesn't make me more advanced. That's true. It might, it might mean you're more advanced and it may mean you're more passionate. It may mean you like working hard. It may mean so many things. Um, but you want to look at Krishna consciousness in, in a balanced way and if for example you're very successful in your service but you're lacking in humility or you're lacking in tolerance or you're lacking in something or more seriously you're lacking in sadhana then we'll say oh, the service you did is good but you're not balanced because you're lacking on the on the side of character or you're lacking on the side of humility or forgiveness or tolerance or compassion. So it's not balanced, it's not complete. So we don't want to say you're bad or we don't want to say that your service is not valuable. And we don't want to say you didn't sacrifice and do austerity to do your service, and we don't want to say you don't have devotion. We would just we would just say you're incomplete as an individual because you you have the service side down, but you you're lacking on the renunciation or the humility or the tolerance or something. So you're out of balance. So you're not complete. You're not whole. So that's how you would look at the statement: um, the realization that service doesn't make me more advanced. It just it just means it's not balanced. There's, there's over, you're, you're, you're stressing, overly stressing service over developing the qualities of a Vaishnava. Now, th- think about humility, it's not optional. So it's not like you can say, well, this humility, humility is difficult and I'm proud, and, but I can do a lot of service. So I'm just going to chuck the humility thing. It's it's really not for me. But I'll just do service and I'll hope someday Krishna will make me humble. You can think that way, but that's not really the best way to think. I mean, Krishna can make you humble. But the proper way to think is that humility is essential to bhakti. It's an essential ingredient and it's an essential characteristic to come to bhakti and so I can't write it off. I have to practice it. I have to develop the attitudes of humility and so forth. So if if you understand, so here's, here's the thing, it's a very interesting thought, that 
the, the last thing you said is coming from a very material perspective on humility. You said, it seems always thinking I'm not a devotee, I'm not a Vaishnava. It becomes a path of frustration and depression. Actually, it's, it's a path to ecstasy. And it's a symptom of ecstasy also. So if you're thinking of it materially, then yeah, it will be a path to frustration and depression. Because then you'll just think, I'm no good, I'm bad, I'm worthless, I'm useless, I'll never be a good devotee. And it's all negative. But, but just try to understand, if a devotee is actually thinking that others are better and he's not a devotee, how high is his consciousness to think that? It's not in a state of depression, it's in a very exalted state. You understand? Because nobody, nobody can think like that unless they're very exalted, unless they're, they're experiencing, how do I want to say that there's an ecstasy in experiencing humility, in tasting humility. It is, it is an amazing taste. And so what you're saying is, is like if I were to rephrase what you're saying, and say, it's almost like you're saying, if I'm not acknowledged, if there's not some pride within me, then I'll become depressed and discouraged. But if you understand what genuine humility is, you'll become ecstatic. The humility that you manifest will make you ecstatic. It will give you a taste. See, because pride is its a poison. The Acharyas, they compare pride to pig stool. Sometimes they compare it to donkey urine. So that's how they experience it. And for them, humility is like a high form of transcendental bliss and ecstasy. See, so we shouldn't see humility as something depressing. Now, if it's humility in the mode of ignorance, yeah, then it's depressing. So, there, there is a sense that you can be proud that you've done service, proud to be a devotee, proud to be a follower of Srila Prabhupada. You can be, you can, there is a sense of being proud but not being puffed up. So that's, that's fine. But to think I'm not a devotee means I don't have love of Krishna. That's what it means. Okay, so you know you don't have love of Krishna. That shouldn't depress you. That should, but you should be happy that you're in the process of getting love of Krishna. So let's say I have no love. What do we say? Um, I'm not a devotee. I'm not a Vaishnava. I don't have any love for Krishna. Because a Vaishnava is one who has love for Krishna. It's like this Mahaprabhu. He once said that I should kill myself because I'm living in this world without love for Krishna. I'm maintaining my life, but I don't love Krishna. So I shouldn't maintain my life. So that, that's the idea, that I don't have any love for Krishna. But... At least I'm on the path. So Mahaprabhu is saying, yeah, I really shouldn't live. That's a very high level of consciousness. Okay, so I don't have love of Krishna. That's the reality. It's just, you know, you can't pretend that you do if you don't. Right? So don't become depressed that you don't have it. Be excited that you're on the path. But understand, the more you feel you don't have it, that's a sign that you have it. So, if you're feeling, I don't have love of Krishna and it's genuine, it won't frustrate you. Because if it's genuine, it's only coming from the fact that you have it. And you have a lot of bhakti, and therefore, the more you have it, somehow or other, the less you feel you do have it. Because the more you understand what pure devotional service is, the more you feel you don't have it. But that's the sign that you're pure. It's your humility is making you feel, I'm not a good devotee. I'm not qualified. So you, so you have to try to understand humility as, let, let's, let's say, let's 
put the connotation with the humility, ecstasy. So let's say every time we think of the word humility, then we think of it means ecstasy. Like I say, I say every time you think of the word surrender, th- replace it with the word love, because then it's more accurate and it has less negative connotations. So every time you say humility, then think love. Uh, no, excuse me. Yeah, yes. What, what, what did I just say? Humility means, I completely forgot, when you think of humility, oh yeah, think of ecstasy, think of taste, think of relish. Because when you actually have humility, that's, you'll be tasting and relishing, and it'll be sweet. So if we're thinking of humility as something bitter, that means we're very contaminated. Now, for a materialistic person, humility is bitter. For a transcendental person, it's sweet. And I think I once wrote a statement, experiencing the ecstasy of being insignificant. So you think, how could you be happy if you're insignificant? How could you be happy if you feel you're insignificant? Maybe you can't understand that, but it's true, and so we're trying to understand. If I feel insignificant, that brings me closer to Krishna. Dasa, 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 anandas, the more I'm servant, the closer I am to Krishna. So I'm feeling insignificant. I'm, a, I'm lowest on the totem pole. I'm the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant. On the pile of cards, my card's on the bottom. That actually gets you closer to Krishna. So now that humility, which made you feel lower than the lowest, has gotten you closer to Krishna, so that becomes your ecstasy. I know this is difficult to understand because it doesn't make sense materially, and that's why the topic of humility is, in a, in a sense, can be bewildering, because it's really, it's really beyond the realm of our experience. I mean, we might have some inkling of what humility is, but it's not really the depth of humility that. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is describing. You understand? It's 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 a different realm. So it's like it's like you're looking at something you have no experience of and you're relating it from the perspective of something you have experience of, and you're relating it from the perspective of something you have experience of that doesn't make you happy. Or that's depressing. So then you project that on the transcendental and you think, oh, if I were humble, I would become depressed. If I would think I'm not a devotee, that just becomes depressing. But it doesn't because thinking that you don't have bhakti, thinking that others have bhakti, that's Krishna consciousness. That's how a Krishna conscious person thinks. So if you actually think that way, you're in Krishna consciousness. And if you're in Krishna consciousness, then you're happy, you're ecstatic. You understand what I'm saying? The more humility you manifest, the more Krishna consciousness you manifest. And so therefore, if you have 50% humility, you have 50% Krishna consciousness. If you have 100% humility, then you manifest 100% Krishna consciousness. Then you're going to be happy because you're Krishna conscious. So, you know, I think the humility that you're describing is more like humility in ignorance. You know the, humili- the kind of humility that that you would be taken advantage of for having, but it's not exactly what we're talking about. Where I mean, okay, let let's say, let's say, Prem Kishore, you were in a consciousness that every devotee you saw, you just appreciated. You're such a great devotee. You're so wonderful. You'd be happy if you had that consciousness for sure. But in order to have that consciousness, you have to place yourself lower. And so then you're thinking, well, if I place myself lower, I won't be happy. But you're only thinking of the lower part. You're not thinking of the positive part. The, that if I place myself lower, I would appreciate everybody. And I'd be living with this very deep form of appreciation. So then I would be very blissful. So you understand the point that on one side it's negative. I'm very fallen, I'm not a Vaishnava, 
Uh, there's nothing good about me. So that all sounds negative. But on the other side, it generates this consciousness that I see others better than me, that I appreciate what they're doing. And because it generates that consciousness, you become blissful. So it's not one-sided. I think you know, what you're saying is kind of viewed as one-sided. Oh, it's just, I'm not a devotee. That's depressing. That's a depressing thought. You understand? Anyway, I think you understand. Um, I'm going to read on. Um, let's hear what you say. Okay. What's the connection between love and humility? Well, the connection between loving Krishna and humility is three things. We need humility to develop love of Krishna. Humility is part of love of Krishna. It's an ingredient of love. It's a way to get it. It's an ingredient. You need it to make love, and it's a byproduct of love. It's all three. So we need to practice humility to get love, to attain love of Krishna. You can't have love of Krishna if you're not humble, because humility is a component part of love. And it's also sometimes said a byproduct. So you practice humility, you get love, and from love more humility comes. But that humility that comes is not a practice anymore. It's who you are. So, just like Mahaprabhu, he's reciting the Shishastakam, and then he recites the Trinata piece, Sunichana verse, and he becomes overcome with love of Krishna when he's reciting that verse. So, where there's humility, there's, there's going to be love of Krishna. Where there's pride, there's not going to be. Right? Right, Kush? What's the connection between pride and lust? It's like the same thing. Where there's pride, then uh, so many, so so many wrong ways of thinking. So lust is naturally a product of that. Envy is a product of that. It's just pride is the foundation of material consciousness. So humility pulls the carpet of material consciousness out. And when you remove material consciousness, what lies under material consciousness is love of Krishna. So humility is the means for awakening love of Krishna. <clears throat> and it's the product of love of Krishna. So Prem Kishore says, how do you help a person forgive themselves when they are in that mood of thinking they are horrible, the lowest? Number one, and when you're thinking you're horrible and the lowest, that's not humility. See, so, that, so we have to understand that has nothing to do with humility. And one of the ways you help a person is by complimenting them, by showing them all the good in them, and trying to get them to appreciate the good within themselves, and trying to, to get them to realize that, that we all make mistakes. And it's not about the mistakes, but it's what you do after you get up, after you fall. And that... Unless we're forgiven, unless Krishna forgives us, then we can't continue. So if Krishna is willing to forgive us, if he holds our past sins against us, then we're all condemned forever. But he doesn't. And so, if Krishna is willing to forgive us, then if we don't forgive ourselves, then we're doing something that even Krishna doesn't do. We're we're showing less kindness to ourselves than Krishna shows to us. So at least you should show as much kindness to yourself as Krishna shows to you. And certainly Krishna forgives you. And Krishna wants you to be happy. And if you're doing anything or in a consciousness where you're not forgiving yourself, that makes you unhappy, then Krishna's not happy. Right? Well, Krishna doesn't want to see you suffer.
But the other thing you can say is that you're not horrible. You may have done something horrible, but it doesn't mean you're horrible. Or you said the lowest. You um, may have acted in a low way, but it doesn't mean that's permanent. So, if you allow yourself to become discouraged, then you stay down. So, when we confront our faults or we make mistakes, then we should become more, we should work harder. Rather than slack, we go, we go forward, we work harder. That's usually what you do in material life, right? You, there's a setback, you work harder. So, the next thing. Can you appreciate others without thinking of yourself negatively? You see, humility doesn't... It's not thinking of yourself negatively as you might think of it. It's thinking realistically. I don't have love of Krishna. That's realistic. I have so many anarthas. That's realistic. So you could say, well, you know, but I don't want to focus on them. Humility doesn't mean you're absorbed in a depressed state of focusing on all your bad traits. Humility means you're focused on Krishna. Krishna, I don't love you, and I want to love you, and I'm very low, you're very high, and I need you to come down and show mercy and pick me up. That's what humility does. It doesn't make you depressed. It doesn't make you forget Krishna makes you come closer to Krishna. So what you're saying is, can you appreciate others without thinking of yourself neg negatively? I understand it, but practically it's difficult. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is saying that if we don't, if we don't develop some genuine sense of humility, we won't appreciate others. So, what we're saying here is when you start to recognize your own deficiencies, you'll, you'll be in a position where you can more freely appreciate others because you're aware of your own faults. If you're not aware of your own faults, you will tend to think you're almost perfect in Rather than appreciate others, you'll condemn, criticize, right? You understand? Jai and Dustin. Um, it takes some time to understand this. It, it's, really, it's really something you have to experience. But any... Any kind of thinking that there's something wrong with me, I'm bad, I have bad qualities, and so on, that causes you to become discouraged or depressed is, material, is, a, is a shadow reflection of humility. It's, it's humility, like shining, being shown down into the mode of ignorance. So then it just becomes a form of um, very self-centered thinking. Oh, I'm so bad, I'm so bad, I'm so bad. And then I'm so unhappy because I'm so bad. But in Krishna consciousness, our happiness is not our concern. It's Krishna's happiness. So we, if, if we say, I'm bad, you could reword that and say, Krishna's good, and I want him, and I'm far away from him. And I'm very, very far, and I don't like being far, and that being far is making me Think of him more. So in this context, being far means I'm bad, there's something wrong with me. Right? You understand? So is that I'm I'm I have no good qualities, I'm I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, I'm that. So we, we're denigrating ourselves. But let's translate that into saying, Krishna, I'm far from you. I want you, I'm far from you. I'm so this, I'm so that. So whatever the negative is that we are, it's separating us from Krishna. So when a pure devotee says, I'm, I'm not a devotee or I'm not qualified or any of that, he's just saying, Krishna, I'm so far from you. Can, 
I want to be closer to you. You see what I'm saying? So the negative things that the devotee says about themselves is not negative. I'm so low, I'm so this and that. It just means I'm further away from Krishna and that's making me really, making me desire to become closer. So it's really quite positive. Now, if we wanted to look at your question from more of a psychological position, then we say, yes, you should feel good about yourself. It's, it's, but you shouldn't be proud. That's the point. Is it, is it wrong to feel good about yourself? No, but don't be proud. Don't think you're better. Compare yourself to yourself. Okay, I'm doing better today than yesterday. That's good. But I'm still far from Krishna. What I really have to be proud of, after all, I'm proud to be a disciple of Prabhupada. My pride is in him. If I do anything wonderful, it's his mercy. And I always remember that. And then I'm good. Then I'm in the right consciousness. Does that make sense? Oh, somehow or other, Mahatma Das is falling asleep while he's talking. Maybe I'm channeling the god of sleep right now. So, this be, um, so this idea can you appreciate others without thinking yourself negatively? What Bhakti Siddhanta is saying is that if you have high estimation of yourself, you'll always put yourself above others and you won't you won't appreciate them. So it's not necessarily that it means you're thinking of yourself negatively. You're just you're feeling that you're not Krishna conscious. You don't have it. And you're feeling that others have it more. So you appreciate it their sincerity and their mood and their service like that. Anyway, let that sink in a little bit. And then Savitri says, the nice thing about being insignificant is that I'm not in charge anymore. So I don't have to worry. There is relief in, in being insignificant because then you can feel free to make mistakes and be real as a human being and admit those mistakes. That this is how I am. This is what I do. I have imperfection. So then, then you can be okay with not being perfect. Because anyone who's not okay with not being perfect will not be happy. They'll, they'll suffer a lot. Kush knows that. As Kush is a perfectionist, and well, yeah, anyone who's a perfectionist knows that everything is not perfect and it can cause a lot of frustration. Side topic, it's the disappearance day of Kopabhata Goswami. Maybe you could tell us something about him later. Yes, he was very humble. There's some pastimes of how he displayed exemplary humility. All the, all the great devotees display, exempl display exemplary humility, all the Goswamis, all the followers. You see, the, the example that Prabhupada often gives is Sanatana Goswami, he's a great, great scholar, he knew so many languages, well respected, had so many good qualities. But he took the humble position when he approached Mahaprabhu and he said, I'm very learned. I mean, people say I'm learned, but I, I don't know who I am. So he took this super humble position. So, how does any pure devotee exemplify humility? It's through seeing that others are better. Prabhupada would sometimes say his disciples are better than him. So, Vainarati says, each time I'm cooking for my deities or putting them to sleep or waking them up or doing mala arctic, I really, really feel that I love Krishna. Also, if I'm in the street or in the bus, I really feel that I love Krishna. Or if I'm alone, 
or somebody frequently, I think to myself, I love Lord Jagannath. Whatever. The point is that I'm sure that I'm not humility and I'm sure that I'm not mistake. Am I loving to Krishna or my love is all an illusion? Something false and not honest with myself? And it's all false and I don't really have nothing of love for Krishna. Well, depends what you mean by love. If you say love in the in, and define it as prema, then I would have to say no. You may have traces of prema, but not yet. That's a very high level of Krishna consciousness. If you say, I'm attracted to Krishna to serve him, and you translate that as love, yeah, then we could say, okay, you have love. Okay, now... Anyone have anything else to say before we go on? Oh, Venerati, we're reading hers. Sorry. No, we did read hers. Is your love an illusion? I don't. I th I think it's more that you're becoming attached to Krishna. But if you study nectar devotion, you understand what love of Krishna is. That it's very exalted. And it may not be that we're experiencing love yet. And maybe someday we will. But when you love Krishna, you can't bear to be separated from him. It drives you crazy. And there's so many other symptoms of loving Krishna that are not symptoms that manifest when there's mundane love. So I think it's safe to say we don't love Krishna, but we have attraction, we have affection, like that. Oh. So Ven so the Veno you can maybe you say you feel affection or you feel attraction. All right, I think I need to end because I'm starting to fall asleep. Have you noticed that? Does it look like I'm going to fall asleep? Anyway, this, was, this, this as was last class is still a general summary. I'm just, just like this shift. shift let's, we want to shift out of material concepts of humility. Because these material concepts make us think if we're humble, we're going to get taken advantage of, we're not going to be happy, we're going to be depressed, we're always going to be looking at our faults. It's not like that. Humility is a very high level of consciousness. So then, here, Venerat is saying, true love for Krishna um, from my my contaminated heart. So, it's true love in a potential form. You could say that. Okay, I'm going to have to lay down here. So we almost made it. We went 50 minutes. It's pretty good. I didn't realize I'd be so tired, but I had a really tough day yesterday and no extra rest today. So, anyway... Some, something to think about. What every, I think everything I said it just really needs to sink in a little bit. Okay? So we're going to sign off and then we're going to see you next week. Next Saturday, hopefully. We'll be in touch to confirm that. Okay? Hare Krishna. Jai Prabhupada.